Good morning, distinguished colleagues. My name is Tonia Onyeka, and I'll be making this presentation on pain management in low middle income countries. Uh, this story was told by Dr. Gopal of a 20 year old Malawan who had an, a rare lymphoma that was so painful that because he wasn't able to get adequate pain relief, he took his own life. Uh, these are some of the examples of the type of things that our patients go through when we try to do all we can and we're unable to because of the severe limitations in analgesic supply and other aspects of pain management in our countries. So we all should understand that there's a huge burden placed on low middle income countries from untreated and under treated pain. And this is in addition to the burden of non-communicable diseases. Now, how big is the problem of pain in the low middle income countries? It's a huge problem. Uh, this research by Dr. Felicia Nall and her colleagues was able to expose the, the extent of the problem, saying that less than 1% of our patients that need morphine get, get that relief less than 1%. In fact, they called it a medical public health and moral failing and a travesty of justice. And just imagine that out of 298.5 million metric tons of morphine available, only 0 0.1 million metric tons are available to low middle income countries. 80% uh, of our population have no access to treatment for moderate to severe pain. And the majority of that 80% live in our countries. Uh, for example, 60% of Mongolia people who die, they, they die in need of pain relief. Look at the prevalence of cancer pain. It's more than 50% in all the continents of the world. That's a huge, huge problem with pain in, on our hands. Now, we also should be reminded there's an economic burden. There's loss of productivity, loss of time when someone is ill and, and has pain that is limiting productivity. There's also reduced quality of life. There's disability, suffering. Some individuals even lose their jobs. And for patients who have cancer, especially when the cancer is metastatic, they need continuing care, they need rehabilitation, and they need end-of-life care, and all these add to the economic burden of the patients with pain. Some societies accept pain as a normal part of life. Some other societies feel that opioid medication is only should be used only for patients who are dying. And another, another group of uh, 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 patients that we may be faced with maybe people who believe in the traditional medicine of their communities. And, they, and therefore, no matter how much analgesics you prescribe, they will reject it outright. So we need to know that these are barriers are there and they are real. I'll give you an example of the Bedouin women of North Africa and the Fulani women of Northern Nigeria. They have something in common. They, they bear pain, the pain of labor. So if you meet such patients and they're in labor and they don't utter a sound, that's a, that's a false impression because they're actually in pain, but because the culture does not allow them to express their pain, they would deliver that child without uttering a sound, and you'd be fooled to think that they are not in labor or they don't have labor pains. Similar things in that culture, the Sharu, which is a flogging festival of the Fulani men of northern Nigeria, when they want to have a, 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 the, the hand of a lady in marriage, they want to prove their, their manness, they are flogged, and they are not expected to cry out or wince or even express any pain. So we need to know all of that. In this uh, research by Pile and his colleagues, we see that this is, pain is even seen as a sign of weakness and shame for some communities. And there, there, there are cultural gender role expectations. Men are not meant to cry. So a man in pain may come to you and he may not cry, may not show any emotions. We need to have this at the back of our mind. I think the biggest barrier for pay, uh, pain management in low middle income countries is the institutional barriers, because we find that there are overly restrictive opioid laws regarding the procurement, sale, and distribution of these drugs. Uh, we find out there are bureaucratic delays in dispensing these drugs. And, we, and then we, we'll see that there's a huge disparity in the consumption of these opioids with low middle income countries which have huge 
numbers of patients with pain getting little compared to the high income countries. Look at India, the second largest, most populous nation in the world. Uh, we have these landmark studies by Professor Cleary and his colleagues uh, of the Global Opioid Policy Initiative, where they looked at all the continents in the world at the formulary availability and regulatory barriers to access to opioids for cancer pain. And their findings were huge. They found that opioids are continue to be low throughout the Middle East and Asia, with the exceptions of Israel, Japan, and South Korea. And it continues to be low in Latin America and even in Africa. And they also found that Africa has the lowest opioid consumption per capita globally. And even when the opioids are placed in the formularies in these countries, in, in the low middle income countries, they're often un unavailable. And access is significantly uh, impaired by widespread overregulation. Uh, here on our screen, we can see uh, countries in the Latin America and Caribbean see extreme restriction in countries like Mexico, Ecuador, Bolivia, and in Africa, you see extreme ex uh, restriction to opioid availability in countries like Egypt and Mauritius and Sierra Leone. Uh, for example, in Morocco and Egypt, you need special license to be able to prescribe opioids. And in the Philippines, you need special prescription forms. And there are maximum daily doses in certain countries that limit the number of doses you can give your patient per day or even for a period of time. Uh, other barriers in the institutions are, may, may be sh staffing shortages, low physician loss ratio, lack of pain clinics, and other infrastructures that can help us to um, take care of our patients' pain, and the biggest is the analgesic stockouts. What are the clinician barriers? Uh, education, inadequate education, poor knowledge of pain management is a huge thing. Then fear of opioids, which is called opiophobia, the fear of addiction or abuse or inappropriate use. Then where in, we find out that in the in most countries, in low middle income countries, there's a lack of a pain curriculum in the undergraduate and postgraduate medical uh, curriculum. And, and this is a huge problem because this now translates to producing doctors who don't know much about how to manage a patient's pain. And of course, institutions don't have pain guidelines and everybody is doing anything as they like regarding pain management. Other barriers include uh, illegal uh, use of opioids, extremely limited analgesic choices. We're going to see that later. And our patients don't even get educated for their pain. What about the management of pain in children in these low and middle income countries? Uh, there's not enough uh, evidence or not enough data to tell us about the incidence or the prevalence of the pain in children living in these countries. But approximately 11 to 38 percent of children will report chronic pain. And there is a high variability in analgesic practices. In fact, one uh, systematic review on pediatric pain noted that of 404 procedures done on Kenyan neonates in one day, none of them received analgesia. Um, where are the sources of pain for children? It's huge. It can be cancer, sickle cell, road traffic accidents. In children who are in war-torn areas, there can be post-war injuries. We also have, uh, they can also have pain from periprocedural uh, uh, peri pain, and then, of course, from bonds. Uh, what are the barriers to managing a child's pain? Some of the barriers that are, uh, I'm going to mention now actually peculiar to children. So the general barriers as affects what we talked about, you know, clinician barriers, institutional barriers, then we and then social cultural barriers. But then we have some that are peculiar to children. For instance, pain communication difficulties, finding children who are preverbal or nonverbal or cognitively impaired. There, there are huge issues with them. And then in these environments. There are lack of validated culturally sensitive pain assessment tools. For instance, you're looking at the Wong Baker faces pain rating scale that it has been constructed using minions. And those young children on the screen too, I can't see them being able to use the Wong, basis, uh, the Wong Baker faces pain rating scale with minions because I don't think that they have televisions and they have actually watched the minion move movies before. So these are some of the issues that we have faced. And then, of course, pain expression and pain language in these countries are unique. And as a clinician, you should find out in a certain way you're working, 
what is the pain? What what are, how do people express their pain? What is the language of pain? So that that would be effective in, in communicating pain uh, with the child and the pain management decisions with the child and the family. Um, what happens when you neglect the cultural influences of pain in these children? What happens is that you have miscommunication, you are not able to make a good diagnosis, and then you give inappropriate or ineffective treatment to the patient. Uh, for instance, men from Lesotho and young children, male children, are taught. So these are some of the things that you must understand. And then if you're in those environments, you need to respect those cultures. And, and that would help you even while you're trying to treat a patient's pain. How can we advance the management of pain of children in low middle income countries? Another landmark uh, study was done by Professor Eccleston, uh, it was called Delivering Transformative Action in Pediatric Pain. Uh, they came up with four things that we can do and we can do them simultaneously. We can, four goals. The first is to make pain better, which means we talk about the pain with our, our colleagues, talk about the pain with the child and the family, uh, do something about it. And of course, do something about the stigma of pain. The second is to make pain understood. How do we do that? We learn more about pain, research more uh, and advance our knowledge. The third is to allow communication make pain visible. How do I make pain visible? We do that by allowing communication. Let the patient talk to you, listen to the patient, observe the patient, assess the patient's pain in all manner you know to do. And the fourth is to make the pain better by using the most effective and available means of treatment that you can find. Uh, the largely non-opioid analgesics are popular, aspirin, paracetamol, NSAIDs. And then for for cancer pain, especially severe cancer pain, what is widely available are parenterals of pentazosin and pethidine, very popular. Uh, immediate release morphine is available in some countries. Sustained release is rare. Fentanyl patches are not readily available in low middle, many low-middle-income countries. Uh, uh, opioids for moderate pain like uh, tramadol, uh, dihydrocodine, tartarate, codeine, and cocodamol are available in a lot of countries. We also find out, we see uh, some combinations of two, three drug analgesic adjuvant combinations like paracetamol, codeine, caffeine, also being used in our hospitals. Uh, I'd like to talk about ketamine. I, I know that a lot of us have used this drug and we're using this drug. It's, it's inexpensive. Uh, it causes pain reduction during the surgical procedure. So that's something we can add to our momentarium. Cannabis, gaining popularity, not enough studies yet, but studies suggest that uh, uh, using people that use cannabis, they require less opioids. So it reduces the, the demand for opioid medications for pain. Amitriptyline, carbamazepine are important also, and we find them in in good use in low middle income countries. Let's talk about pain research in, in these countries. It is vital so that we can identify the areas that we need to work on, areas that we can implement our scientific findings so that patients can have good outcome. But the problem about pain research in low middle income countries is that it's sparse. Our funding is very poor and it's almost non-existent in some countries. Uh, many areas of research are redundant also. And then, of course, the publications are of many of our research from low and middle income countries go into journals that don't have much visibility. So we find out that the pain research output from the low middle income countries, especially sub-Saharan Africa, is very low uh, because there's a poor research methods, they, are, they use poor writing styles, and then they have poor academic infrastructure, little or no internet coverage, and no access to e-databases. And uh, research really is not a priority for many low middle income country governments. And then of course the problem, the bane of the problem of corruption and grief in, in greed in governance prevents the investment of these governments in pain research. So what are the priorities for pain research for low middle income countries. We need to research into the development of protocols, need to look at post-operative pain, we need to look at controlled randomized 
randomized control trials, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And we also need to consider things like pain research sponsorship, pain research mentorship, tra training in pain research and publication. And we need to forge uh, partnerships between journals in the low middle income countries and the high income countries. How can we improve our practices in, in these countries? We can do that through three core strategies, education, expanding treatment options and advocacy. Uh, this is the Essential Pain Management Program by the Australian uh, and New Zealand College of Anesthetists. It's been going on for several years uh, since uh, 2010. The course has been taught in over 50 countries of the world. I also would like to mention uh, the, the program that belongs to the World Federation Societies of Anesthesiologists which are the fellowships, the pain fellowships that are conducted in several countries. We also have the International Association for the Study of Pain Developing Pro a Countries Project, which is an initiative to improve pain education. Then I'd like to mention the online pediatric pain curriculum for um, any healthcare provider anywhere in the world. It's provided by the Sick Kids, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. They are launching this year a pediatric pain in low middle income country uh, module as part of the online pediatric pain curriculum. I also like to mention that uh, Kenya developing, the country Kenya developing their first neonatal analgesic guidelines. When we talk about pain in low middle income countries, especially Sub Saharan Africa, uh, this is mentioning Hospice Africa, uh, Uganda is a must because this is where the genesis of the use of oral liquid morphine started from. So today they were the first to start production of oral liquid morphine. They're the first to authorize nurse prescribing of oral liquid morphine and many countries have learned from them and they are picking up. Uh, Mongolia is one country that I would like to use as a case study. And uh, it's thanks to the work done by Dr. Odun Tuya uh, from 2000, between 2000 and the year 2014, they had had opioids, they were already prescribing opioids and patients, they had had pain managing, management guidelines produced for their patients and for their clinicians to use and their pain, um, values or pain scores reduced because they had increased opioid consumption from not just importing but indigenous production of parenteral morphine, pethidine, and uh, oxycodone. The last thing to talk about would be advocacy. The more we speak about the need for analgesics and the more we speak about the need for adequate pain management in low middle income countries, the more we get results. In conclusion, I would like to say that pain management in children and adults is a health priority. And in the face of several barriers, low middle income countries continue to face an uphill task in managing pain. Uh, for us to manage our patients' pain successfully in these countries, we need to remove regulatory barriers to opioids. We need to disrupt the inequities in analgesic supply. We need to have good pain education and we must have good pain research coming out from these countries. Advocacy and using guidelines and existing successful pain initiatives can be adopted, which we have discussed, can be adopted by other low middle income countries with deficiencies in their pain management. Uh, these are my references and thank yous. Thank you very much.